Good evening. My name is Kate Larson and I'm the director of Tacoma Public Library. On behalf of our board of trustees and staff, it's my honor to welcome you to our keynote Tacoma Reads event with author Marcelo Hernandez Castillo in conversation with Mayor Victoria Woodards. Tacoma Reads is an annual partnership between Tacoma Public Library and the City of Tacoma. It, seats, it seeks to unite our community through dialogue and thought by reading a common text. Tonight's event celebrates the work that helped us to do that, the wonderful book, Children of the Land. In addition to tonight's event, we invite you to continue to engage around the topic of immigration. There are many more Tacoma Reads virtual events for all ages throughout the month of January. Please check the library's website, tacomalibrary.org for details. For our opening performance tonight, I am delighted to introduce the Tacoma Refugee Choir, accompanied by Symphony Tacoma performing Moon Song in a piece recorded on December 8th, 2019 at the Pantages Theater.
Buenas noches. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be with you, uh, with you this evening. My name is Tony Gomez, and um, I will be uh, helping to facilitate questions from the audience this evening. And I want to also give a huge um, thank you to the Tacoma Refugee Choir under the direction of Aaron Ginnup and Symphony Tacoma under the direction of, of Maestra Sarah Eonides. Um, performing the song Moon Song, which was inspired by residents at, um, at a juvenile immigration facility uh, in Fife near Tacoma, um, who talked about the idea of when prompted to do poetry about the moon, said that they never saw the moon um, from, from the facility where they were, and um, is an opportunity to center us our discussion tonight um, on how we connect with community, um, uh, undocumented and documented. And um, I'm thrilled to have um, Mayor Woodards here we'll, who will be introducing our very special guest. So uh, Mayor Woodards. Oh, you're on mute. I keep telling her, this is my favorite gift this year. I, I should turn it around and face it towards me so I will remember to take myself off mute. But Tony, thank you so much for agreeing to be um, our host this evening. And I'm so excited to join um, to join with you this evening to welcome Marcelo to Tacoma through this, through this uh, Zoom platform. I wanna welcome everybody here tonight. Um, and those of you who know me know, I wish nothing more than we could all be in one of the theaters in downtown Tacoma together, that we could be together in person um, for this conversation and all, um, and all throughout of 2020. But I am deeply proud of the way that each of you and our valued library staff have adapted to staying healthy during COVID and enjoying Tacoma Public Library's virtual programs and resources. Um, tonight's virtual event is certainly a special one and I've been waiting for it all year. Um, I should say all of all all of this year and all of last year. Um, tonight we are gathered for our annual headlining Tacoma Reads event to hear from our featured guest, the award-winning author of Children of the Land, Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Marcelo is a poet, essayist, translator, and an immigrant immigration advocate. He's the author of the poetry collection. Senzo Lee, which won the 2017 A. Pullian Junior Prize and his 2018 cat book, Dolce. His memoir, Children of the Land, which was released in 2020 is his most recent publication. His work has appeared or been featured in the New York Times, PBS NewsHour, People Magazine, the Paris Review, Fusion TV, BuzzFeed, Golf, Car, Golf Coast, a journal of literary and fine arts, New England Review, Indian Re Indiana Review, among many others. He currently teaches in the Low Res MFA program at Ashland University. And as Director Larson alluded to in her opening comments, Tacoma Reads is intended to spark conversations about issues that are important to our community. 
Before we launch into questions, Marcelo, I just want to take this moment to say thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, for, thank you for coming to provide a little bit of context as to why this conversation is especially relevant and important to Tacoma. For Tacoma specifically, your book, your story was chosen because it brings a vivid, personal, poignant, and deeply stirring perspective to the larger conversation about immigration. As the home of a privately owned and operated federal detention center, this is a conversation that many community members and all of our council, including our Commission on Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, are deeply committed to furthering. Marcelo, welcome to Tacoma, and let's get started this evening. Thank you, Mary Woodards. You're welcome. So Marcelo, um, what was the process of memoir writing like for you as a poet? Um, did you find yourself uh, slipping into your poet voice? And I felt like I kind of heard that um, as I was listening to it um, audially and reading it. Um, while you were writing, how did it feel to write in prose? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And um, thank you also uh, to the Tacoma Public Library and to the choir that have just played. Um, incredibly thrilled to be here, incredibly thrilled to be talking with you all, and very, very honored that um, my book was selected for the Tacoma Reads. Um, I mean, this it's it's I get I get asked. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes what my book means to the current conversations around mm -hmm. immigration. And for me, that's always a, that's always, that's always a question that um, never ceases to bring something new because immigration is something continuously changing evolving, but also something that I have, I have I've been dealing with my whole life. Um, and as the book, you know, attests, um, something that my family has been dealing with our entire lives um, for the last hundred years or so. And so when I got down to writing this book, I knew it couldn't be in poetry because I knew I couldn't write what I wanted to write through poetry, um, maybe because I was, I allowed myself a kind of um, smoke screen or a kind of um, distance in poetry that wasn't there in prose. And so when I set out to write prose for the, for the first time, um, it wasn't really with the intention of writing a book. It was with the intention of doing something with my attention and my emotions and my, um, you know, uh, linguistic experimentations that I wasn't able to do with poetry at the time, because it was a very difficult time for me when I started writing the first pieces that became um, the first essay uh, in the book. So for me, jumping into it as a poet, not knowing exactly what I was doing, not knowing, you know, the the hardline um, structures or formulas or, um, uh, you know, not being formally trained in, um, in memoir. Um, it was really freeing and liberating to break away from, uh, break away into a type of writing where I didn't always have a voice in the back of my head saying, well, this is good, this is not. Um, write like this, don't write like that. I just didn't. So it was very liberating to suddenly like be exposed to the right side of the margin. And, um, you know, I think, I think um, naturally yeah, I am a poet by at heart. So the language itself um, always was fluid for me. Um, and there's moments in the book where, you know, some people didn't really particularly care for it because it was moments in which the language was allowed to be on its own, live on its own for its own sake, not necessarily to further the plot, not necessarily to 
um, as a device, you know, a jumping off device or for any other reason other than just existing as language, other than just existing as something to, um, other than just language existing. So yeah, I, it was, it was difficult. It was, uh, but it was, it wasn't without its rewards um, because I could fail and I didn't necessarily have to feel bad about it. In fact, failing uh, was a big part of it, failing um, and stumbling through with it and sending pages to my editor and saying, I have absolutely no idea if this is good, if you will throw it away or if I should keep it. I honestly didn't know. Um, so it was at that level of, of um, baby steps that I, that I took kind of feeling my way through language through memory, um, through experience, and just uncovering what it was that my family that I had really gone through, I had never really put it to paper. I, I, so can I, I want to just ask a follow-up. When you, when you talked about rewards and failures in, as, as you were writing the book, book as, as, as it's now completed and it got sent to the printers and you, you knew it was done, what did, you, what did you feel like your greatest reward maybe even personally to you was after, as, after writing the book? Uh, it's happening right now, actually, on a long scale. Um, my mother is translating the book into Spanish and she, uh, she has spent, you know, uh, a long time um, working on it. Um, she's about a quarter of the way through with the book. And this is from a woman who had, you know, as, as you know from the book, she has lived in this country for more than 30 years, self-deported because she thought all hope was lost and then came back. I, I, the book doesn't talk about this because it, it ends um, at this point when she returns, but after her return to the US, she um, started going to the library and taking literacy classes here at the uh, Utah um, Library, and started learning English. Um, started uh, doing what she could never do before because she was too busy working, um, you know. And so now she is uh, um, working towards herself, and she said, "I want to." Translate it not just for me, so that I, not just for her, so that she could understand it better and understand my life better, but also so that she could read it to my aunts who are in Mexico who uh, might not have access to that. So that's one of the biggest rewards that um, I have come away with. And then some of the things that I really kind of like bite my nails <laughs> knowing that she's going to read because we've never had these conversations before. Yeah she will just, you know, out of nowhere, come out from her room, because she lives here with me, um, from translating and just say, I never knew that about you, you know? Oh. And it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, in many families, there are so many things that just don't get talked about. Um, and so it was a way for me to have kind of an indirect conversation with my mother that I never could have. And I still can't because it's difficult for me to talk about a lot of those things. Oh, thank you for sharing that. So the title of your memoir is called Children of the Land, and it comes from a myth from where your mother grew up um, that you describe um, in the chapter called First Movement, Before Me as Niños. Um, they, they, they used to say that there were children living beneath the rocks on the west side of the mountains. If you looked at their faces, you would go blind. So you had to look up at the sky to avoid their stare. Do you find a connection between the myth, um, the myth of Niños de la Terra or children of the land and the bout of temporary blindness um, you were afflicted with when you first crossed the border as a young child? Yeah, I mean, these myths I think followed me my whole life. I just didn't realize how closely they were tied to every part of my spirituality, my, uh, the way that I moved through the world um, was, you know, these myths were formative. And these are, these are kind of myths that, that are shared um, around, you know, when, when there's a party and, and 
you know, all the grownups were would start talking about when they were little and, and um, you know, these kinds of communal exercises, these communal moments um, turned into more than just um, something that I grew up hearing, but something that became very formative in my understanding of who I was, where I came from. Um, a kind of side, side note, uh, my wife, Ruby, uh, uh, started working with somebody uh, who told her about her childhood and told her about all these stories that she heard in her childhood. And my wife said, that sounds really familiar. <laughs> um, where are you from? And it turns out she was from a neighboring town in my home state of Zacatecas, which is a tiny little town that nobody would have known. But it felt validating that something of these existed outside of me, outside mm -hmm. of our family. That it wasn't, and, and it wasn't something that I had imagined that I heard. No, I because I have a terrible memory. Um, but I did hear these things, and these things did exist. Um, so the you know the title it had many 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 other titles that that we finally landed on um, children of the land. Um, but, you know, I think um, the, the myth um, connected to, you know, also things that I questioned um, about myself growing up, like, did I actually go blind? And after speaking with my mother, you know, I have all these vivid memories of that time and just being so frustrated and, and I just inconsolably crying because I couldn't see. Um, it took many, many years to kind of process that and realize that, yes, you know, um, and again, I wasn't able to do that through poetry. So I think that moment of, of stress-induced temporary blindness that, that I suffered, um, you know, had to fit one, one way or another um, in this web of, of um, wisdom that I was that I was given, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think we all try to make sense of our experiences through uh, these kinds of I don't want to even call them um, sayings or cliches or happenings, um, but they are just nuggets of wisdom that we might take for granted when we hear them at first, let's say as children, but as we grow older, we realize how much they apply to our lives in allowing us to understand those moments. So I think stories like those, the, the children of the earth, of these little bugs, which are actually called Jerusalem crickets, I had, I had no idea until somebody pointed it out. Um, you know, uh, and how they had the faces of babies. And if you stared at them, you would go blind. There was a reason why they told us these stories. Maybe it was just because they didn't want kids going around peeking under rocks, you know, and getting <laughs> stuck by a scorpion or something. Um, but the greater mythologies behind that, um, you know, I think uh, whether you like it or not, uh, really, uh, cement your identity um, very, very early on. Wow. So uh, the next question, I, I, the next question, um, Marisa Buss, who is an employee with our, with our library, um, this is a question she posed, so I'm going to give her credit for this question. And she says, I was recently reading Carmen uh, Maria uh, Manchetto's stunning memoir called In the Dream House. It's about a toxic relationship she became trapped in and how she escaped. She says something that made me think about your memoir, and I wanted to ask you what you think about this quote from her book. The memoir is at its core, an act of resurrection. Memoirists recreate the past and reconstruct dialogue. They summon meaning from events that have long been dormant. They braid the clays of memory in essay, and in fact, and perception together. Smash them into a ball, roll them flat. They manipulate time, resuscitate the dead. They put themselves and others into necessary context. 
What are your thoughts on our quote? And I think it's very interesting how, how that quote kind of dovetails with what you were just talking about. But what are your thoughts about that quote? Yeah, I was terrified of memory. First of all, Carmen Maria Machado's book is, is, is phenomenal. She's a phenomenal writer. Um, I met her in Philly and um, uh, that's where she's from. Um, or no, I met her in the Midwest somewhere. I forget where, it was a writing festival. And she, I said, so what, what should I do when I go to Philly? She said, go to the, there's a museum in downtown Philly about like the, uh, um, like uh, about uh, the occult and and um, like weird, like a almost like a. Um, anyways, that's a, that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> I'm glad um, your memory's as good as mine, Marcella. Well, you're not alone. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean that that she, what she's talking about is is about um, I think relenting and ad accepting the fact that objective recreation of experience for memory is impossible. Um, you know, it is messy. It is, I don't know if she said that um, in the quote or not, but she, you know, I get the feeling it is messy. It is a ball that you kind of roll out of perception, out of um, uh, tangible um, mnemonic uh, memories let's say like a taste a smell something very bodily right which is why i was terrified of dialogue i was terrified of a to b to c in a autobiographic way um and i think it's why i turned to poetic devices of you know figurative language i turned to a more symbolist um, uh, take on, on my past and things don't go in order because that's not how they exist in my, in my head, in my memory. As you'll know from the book, it's structured very, very uh, chaotically. You know, it mixes different timelines together. It jumps from one timeline to the next. And really it's built more thematically on, um, you know, one, one thing building on top of the other. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't, I, you know, I, I couldn't admit a Lazarus effect where I could resuscitate exactly what happened. Because like I said, my memory is terrible for particular reasons, not because um, you know, not for any other reason other than blocking those memories out. I don't remember, I say in the book, I think somewhere, I don't remember being eight or nine or 10. I don't remember a moment in my life when I was six, but I have these vivid memories that almost are outside of time. Mm -hmm. And so it took a lot of, a, a lot of like investigation through my family, through my partner who I had, told her about these things in moments when I did remember them. And then she's the one who kind of helped me recreate a timeline. And she's almost like um, a memory vault for me. Oh. So if it wouldn't have been for her, you know, a lot, of that, a lot of those things would have been lost because even my mother didn't know a lot of these things. Um, like I said, she comes to me and she says, I didn't know this about you. So um, it is a messy, uh, thing to to wake something up that's been dormant um, and reconstructing, you know, almost out of the ether, reconstructing memory out of the ether. We all have, um, you know, memories that are more vivid than in others. But at what point do you start to um, uh, inject the past with, you know, your four, your uh, the, your, with your foresight with with what you know now versus what you knew then and or, you know I, I, I'm teach I'm teaching uh, next week actually a workshop in Washington there um, uh, it's called Tin House and um, and it's on it's on memoir so I you know I'm, I'm thinking about these things I'm thinking about did I really experience this like this or is this how I wish that I experienced those things is this how, um, you know, so I guess we, there's a great, I'll end this, this question with a great quote by um, 
the latest Nobel laureate in literature, who's one of my first poets that I read, um, Louise Glick. And she has this poem called Nostos, and it says, it has the line, we live the world once in childhood, the rest is memory. So, um, you know, we experienced the world once in childhood and, um, you know, the rest, the rest is really up to us. Um, I'm not even sure that's how this quote goes, but anyways, in my head, it exists. <laughs> uh, that. So, um, your, your memoir is written in five movements, um, which reminded me of a symphony. I, I love music. And, and I also read um, that some of your work has actually been turned into an opera. Um, can you tell us about that? And also there are places in your book where you talk very vividly about music, um, a, a song in the moment. Um, does music play a, a big role in your creative life? And I, I would, it says if so, how? But I think the answer is yes. So tell us how music plays a big part in your life. <laughs> Yeah, this book was written to a playlist and it's about 200 uh, songs um, that I played over and over and over. And it was a maddening circle, um, you know, going back to like the experience of, or maybe that's what we talked about. We had a conversation with uh, kids at the library um, oh. earlier today. Um, uh, as part of the as part of the event and you know these kids were really really bright really um engaged and i think one of them asked or somebody in there asked you know um what was my experience like writing this book and i think this playlist has uh can say a lot more than than anything else because of the songs that are in there and these songs you know it was a very difficult time for me um a, because I didn't have a therapist while writing a memoir, which you should never do. You should always have a therapist <laughs> write a memoir. Um, so I think in place, uh, you know, I was tearing open things that I just didn't, um, I hadn't, I hadn't ever touched in, 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 you know, I just, they happened and then I would put them away. So um, music for me at this moment was, both a way of accessing that cathartic mode that kind of got me into writing these almost like long asides. There's many places in the book where it's just like an, a meditation on architecture, a meditation on, um, on the architecture of uh, Mexico City buildings. Um, what else? Oh, on late night TV shows. Um, and being interviewed and what the interview means. So um, music was a way for me to kind of kickstart that, that kind of cathartic feeling because it evokes so many, so many emotions um, and a particular song does a trick for particular things. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of like a, a, a trick that I've gotten used to where um, I have a specific set of, of songs that I listen to over and over and over again. And I'm kind of sick of that um, playlist now. I don't want to listen to it anymore. So, <laughs> you know, um, not because they're bad songs, they're great songs, but I've just- I've heard them enough. I've been, yeah, I've been so, I was saturated. I mean, my life was this book and my life was trying to figure out why it was that I remained silent for so many years. Oh. And it's almost as if all at once, everything that I wasn't able to tell, you know, we release a lot of, a lot of pressure and a lot of stress by divulging things, you know, throughout our lives, whether that's with friends or with somebody else, with your parents or your partner, or whoever. But I didn't have that luxury. So when it all came out at once, um, the, you know, I think the music really uh, resonated uh, or reflected that because it was very messy, very chaotic and all over the place. There'd be like Rihanna next to like Bach, next to regional Mexican, next to um, Led Zeppelin, 
um, and uh, Jay Z, and you know, just a hodgepodge. And um, going back to the 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 opera, the opera the opera was written in conjunction with a composer named Reinaldo Moya, who read my poetry, and it was through the poetry that um, he was writing. Uh, different pieces about the immigrant experience. So mine was one part of a larger piece. Um, and, you know, it was an interesting exercise in translation because as we noted from the, from the choir um, uh, performance that we, the, that played right be, um, a little while ago, um, how do you translate experience into into sound, into how do you transfer emotion, linguist emotion that is bodied, embodied in the linguistic into emotion that is embodied in the, um, in sound, in music. You know, it wasn't just about the words that they were saying, but it was about how they were saying. And for me, that's almost more important. Um, is about how something sounds. So um, yeah, he took that, he took some of my poems and I guess withdrew their textures, withdrew some of their images mm -hmm. and withdrew their, the cadences that I guess um, uh, I, I wrote. And um, um, probably I'll read, I'll read one later today um, during the program. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about that. So you are um, you are known. I mean, I, I appreciate that that in addition to your story and what you, what you've experienced, um, you have now become an advocate, um, and and you you you're known for your advocacy around immigration. And so when it comes to immigration reform in the U.S., um, do you think about an ideal future state? Um, in other words, in addition to fixing what is wrong with the system. Do you have a vision of what the future should look like? And can you tell us what that vision is? Can you share with us what that vision is? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've just been, I've been, I've been really uh, fixated on that quote by um, those kids in, in the opening scene of that performance in which they were asked, you know, to talk about the moon and they said, well, there isn't, a, there isn't any moon for us here. Um, and how reflecting on just how inconceivably broken we have, or how, incon how, um, incon how um, irrevocably, no, that's not the word I'm trying to think of, irredeemably, how irredeemable oh. failures our failures have been towards people who are not only not are not only you know um, sacrificing everything that they have known, but are coming here because of things that were started by large in large part by policies that were. That were handled here, you know, uh, U.S. policy has a lot to do with instability in other nations. Yeah. It, you know, all, whether that's the passage of NATO, which really um, uh, did away with a lot of people's um, uh, sustenance in other countries, which forced them to to come searching for for survival. Um, or whether they're fleeing, you know, political persecution or any other kinds of persecution. Um, I think for me, you know, it's not just about um, uh, an ideal situation isn't just about anybody who wanted to can come here, but that people who did come here could thrive. What's the point of being here and of being allowed to be here if we're still not allowed to thrive? So I think that's the difference between the difference between um, um, equality and equity. Okay. You know, equity is bending things that aren't aren't normally bent the way you want them to in order to um, advance a particular group. So um, you know, I think for me, 
a an ideal world is a world in which um, or or an ideal state of immigration um, is one in which um, you know it's so the the bar is so low. I want to say the bar is so low. Um, can we just not put kids in cages? Can we just not um, force people to make life altering decisions? and choose between their family um, or their livelihoods. You know, there's so many avenues for improving. I mean, you know, um, I don't even know what, to, what else to add to that. Um, just that, that I want people to thrive. I want people to, to live to the fullest extent of who they are, you know, whether that's being a doctor, whether that's being a gardener, whether that's being you know, um, an engineer, a poet, um, a filmmaker, you know, there's so much talent out there. There's so, so much talent out there that the few who do get out and do what they want to do and excel at it, um, you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. No, Marcelo, here in Tacoma, we, we call ourselves the city of destiny. Um, and, and very often I say, you know, I, I want us not to just be the city of destiny in name only, but that really my job or the job of people like me who are in policy is to remove all of the barriers so that anybody who wants to fulfill their destiny has the opportunity to do that. And not, not the opportunity just because we say they have the opportunity, but the opportunity because we remove all the barriers that exist so that people cannot do that. Um, and that we give everyone, when we talk about equity versus equality, everyone gets what they need to be successful. And, and not our definition of successful, but as you said, whether it's a poet or a writer or, or an engineer, wh whatever that is, that, that they get that. So thank you for, your, for the work that you do um, and, and for your advocacy because it's so very important. Um, and so I, I'm getting to my last question. My last question, and then we're going to open it up. I know the audience wants to get questions in. Um, but as we mentioned tonight at the start of the program, as I mentioned to you, um, the presence of a federal immigration facility um, here in Tacoma, um, in the Port of Tacoma, gives conversations on immigration a greater sense of urgency. Um, the, the complex issues that surround immigration are literally and very visible close to our home. Um, knowing that advocates have um, hold a variety of visions, how can the municipalities, how can I as, as an elected leader um, work towards the future that you just described? And what can um, the individuals in our audiences do um, on, a, on a personal, on a day-to-day -day level to, to affect the change that we want to see? Yeah. Um... There's a reason why, and this is this. Th there's a long history of this, but there's a re reason why prisons, you know, detention centers are where where they are, location wise. Yeah. There's a reason why they're not in the middle of a city. There's a reason why they're not in the suburbs. There's a reason why you have to drive an hour away sometimes to reach them. Um, because we don't like to deal with, we don't like to admit the guilt of our um, of our institutions and you know uh, immigration, detention, prisons, they are institutions and they are institutions that we don't like to think about because um, we don't want to be uncomfortable. You know, we don't want to, feel complacent um, or that even worse that we have benefited in any way um, shape or form from um, their presence from their um, from perpetuating them even though we use materials we buy goods that were um, created under with prison labor um, even though we um, benefit from the kinds of commercialism that um, and 
industrialism and globalization that forced people to to come and so suddenly you know the u.s wants to say um you know we will cause the problems but we don't want to deal with them yeah. um i think what is most apparent for the everyday individual is to sit with that discomfort and to realize that you know there's growth growth happens in discomfort yeah. um rather than looking away, we have to look at these things. A solid example, the other day I got a text from a friend that said, you know, I'm doing relatively okay. Do you know of an undocumented family who would benefit from having my stimulus? Um, and it was, um, uh, you know, I believe it was her and her partners or it, it might've just been hers, I can't remember. But, you know, immediately I got to my phone and started making, making calls, making texts, who would be, who would benefit? And this isn't somebody who, this is, this wasn't to an organization, though um, support, you know, monetary support to those organizations are very, very important because they provide on the ground physical um, um, support for these individuals, uh, organizations like the, um, uh, uh, the Floricanto um, project that gives provides free legal aid, um, keep kept families together .org, um, demand .org, raices. Um, you know those 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 organizations are vital um, because they they advocate on a much larger scale. But on a day to day scale, for individuals, you know. It's about not looking away, not and realizing the reason why these detention centers are out kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and really, you know, uh, stepping to the plate when, when they can, like that solid example that I had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we do good things to make ourselves feel better, um, to placate you know, uh, our knowledge of just how messed up things are so that we don't necessarily have to go better. But I, but I, I guess I wanna say is, I guess investigate the motives behind even our goodwill. Is it so that we can make the world better or is it so that we can feel better about ourselves? You know, there's a lot of this going on where people will do something and then post it to social media. You know, I, I, I find that kind of disingenuous. Um, you don't necessarily have to publicize that because, you know, some people might not want to publicize the help you have offered them. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that was a, a straightforward answer or, you know, a solid answer as to what can we, what can elected officials, what can individuals do, um, you know, but it takes things as simple as maybe donating to, yeah. Um, donating to the library, donating to um, uh, local orgs, um, and supporting them. Support doesn't have to be financial. Support can just be showing up. Um, you know, uh, like to that um, uh, that choir that just presented the the performance was, I believe, from like what, like a year ago. Um, oh. Showing up and supporting maybe artists who are out here. Um, you know. Um, trying to come up with new ways of looking at the world. Uh, I guess I can solidly just say state two artist um, Julio Salgado is one of them and Josimar Reyes is another. They're both kind of, they're both advocates, they're both artists in their own ways. But, you know, sometimes even just like a retweet of the work, hey, I like this, this person's book, um, you know, let me send you a copy. Not to do a song, but, but um, you know, but but something like that it goes a long way. I saw that's what I was gonna say. Or support support an author by a book. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I think I think what you said is so important, and 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 I think some people will look at it as, as just well that seems selfish. But I really like when you said growth happens in discomfort, and I think sometimes when you don't quite know what to do. And you're normally when you're 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 you know you're kind of fidgeting around because you don't know what to do. It's because you are uncomfortable, and sometimes I think if you just sit in that discomfort, 
um, you will grow and you will then figure, it will come to you what should be your next, your next move. So thank you very much for what I think is really practical um, information and applicable. Well, I know I, I could ask a whole bunch more questions um, just because the book was so um, good to me and, you're, and just hearing your life story and the way in which you told it was very moving, but I think we've got quite a few people who have questions for you as well. Um, so I, I just, I just want, I want to thank you for this opportunity for me to have this chat with you. Um, we are really grateful that you would join us, and we'll get to some closing remarks. But, but Marcelo, before you go, um, we've spoken so much about um, about you being a poet, and I thought we couldn't leave, we couldn't leave here tonight without hearing um, one of your one of your poems and they sent me a couple so I got to pick um, and I really um, love to hear you recite your poem on um, Lee. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is the title poem of my first book. Um, the Speaking of, of supporting artists, the artist is a San Antonio based artist who came up with the title. Oh, wait, wait. I can't see them. Oh, yeah, now we can see. Yeah, there you go. Um, oh, with, beautiful. With the art, and it's a little hummingbird. Um, her name is Lisette Chavez. She's um, based out of San Antonio. Oh, awesome. So, so check out her lithographs. She posts okay. uh, stuff on, on, online. Um, yeah, Sensantle is um, the Nahuatl word for mockingbird. And this book really was driven out of a um, a desire to name what it was that I did not have yet in terms of a relationship, in terms of naming what it was that, uh, putting a name to how I felt about somebody else. Um, and that's kind of where the, where the first line comes from. And so something like being Mockingbird, you know, being a, a bird that has no song of its own, but um, mimics that of others. Um, is what I found myself doing. And it has an epigraph by the poet Jean Toomer. Uh, it says, emptiness is a thing that grows by being moved. something. Because the bird flew before, there was a word for flight. Years from now, there will be a name for what you and I are doing. I licked the mango of the sun between its bone and its name, between its color and its weight. The night was heavier than the light it hushed. Pockets of unsteady light, the bone, the seed inside the bone, the echo and its echo and its shape. Can you wash me without my body coming apart in your hands? Call it wound, call it beginning. The birds be twisted into a small circle of awe. You called it cutting apart. I called it song. It didn't sound that good when I read it. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Tony, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mayor Woodards. And Marcelo, thank you so much for, for sharing um, your writing with us, your poetry, and also your insight um, that uh, connects experiences that are so, um, so vital to our communities, in, particularly here in Tacoma. Um, I'm, you know, as someone who works in arts education, thinking a lot about the young people in our city whose stories are reflected and refracted in, in the words that you've, you've put to paper and, um, and, and how powerful um, that is. Um, and I was really struck by the, the themes that, um, that you and Mater Woodard spoke about, um, you know, in particular, I'm thinking about being seen and being unseen and kind of the relationship between those things and then relationship itself to family, to place, society, to documentation. Um, and another theme that stood out um, was the one around the idea of, of um, the kind of the unorganized nature of, you know, you talked a little bit about 
um, the kind of the fragmentation of of how your story comes together that it's not necessarily this this kind of linear path but it is um, something that um, that fires like synapses and um, and so um, that relates to one of the first questions um, we received this this evening from JC uh, Eskinka who um, who said that reading children of the land um, reminded him a lot of a quote by Ocean Vuong who um, in talking about the process of his own memoir said that often we demand of the American novel to be cohesive, a monolithic statement of a generation. But having had grown up post 9-11, cohesion was not part of our generation's imagination, nor our language or self-identity. If I had to write my own version of the American novel, it would look more like fragmentation. And uh, JC goes on to say that he felt this, this uh, statement very strongly as he was reading your work and and ask what is um, um, how is the concept of fragmentation um, is it coming from a similar place or a very different place for you than than what we heard in the quote from from Ocean Vuong? Yeah, um, thank you for that question and thank you for the uh, for the context around that. Um, I think I feel really similar to Ocean. Um, and you know, I I have a I have a, a lecture that I give uh, that's titled "In Defense of Entropy," and it's you know this reaction against neat closures that we sometimes yearn for in films, in books, um, in other narratives that we want. Um, for a sense of, of, of um, you know, bookend, bookendedness, um, for a sense of, of completeness. We don't like to leave something, you know, unfinished or have something left unfinished with unfinished answers. But that's been the reality for many of us uh, in our formative years, as um, Ocean mentioned. Um, in our post 9-11 realities. Um, fragmentation has been a way not only of how we remember our past, because oftentimes they're not, our stories aren't given to us in a very linear way. We don't have the privilege of being granted all of this information as other people do. You know, it's not as easy as just going on ancestry.com and then just, you know, building that nice, um, that nice family tree. Um, for some of us, uh, those records are burned. For some of us, those records don't exist. So, um, you know, fragmentation, uh, a fragmented discourse and a fragmented reality feels a lot more familiar. Um, and it's not a, it's not an intention to obscure it's an intention to preserve how indeed it, it the, you know the world exists rather than you know this very neat every you know things don't exist in exist in a neat box um, parenting doesn't exist in a neat box schooling doesn't your work doesn't so why should we represent the world in a way uh, that is anything other than you know um, that resists explanation. That's why we turn to arts and artists and books um, because I think they offer some of those explanations. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's funny that they mentioned uh, his memoir uh, because it's penned as a novel, but it's also kind of like, it's very, um, you know, a autobiographic novel um, so I was also thinking of doing the book as a novel because of the fragmented nature of how I want to express things. I wasn't sure if I could do that in memoir and I went ahead and just, you know, did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I think that is, I mean, it's, it's a powerful testament and I know that, um, you know, um, uh, JC, they're someone who is very, um, uh, involved in um, literary conversation on a community level. And so um, uh, I know that this is going to um, go far and further in that conversation. Thank you. Um, 
And I, I think that what you talk about too, in terms of the idea of, of not having the luxury or the privilege to have experience laid out in a linear form, I think that's very powerful. And that is, I'm, I'm just thinking about the layers of that, you know, of, of you know, not having that sense of that, that privilege of knowing where your family came from or what your grandparents or your great grandparents stories were and how those things are obscured and, and literally, you know, uh, in generations burned, you know, that history burned by colonial powers, for example. Um, uh, and I want to tie that into the, the last couple questions that we have um, that I'm going to try and weave together. Um, and one of our um, participants is asking if you could finish your parents' story a little bit. Are they okay? Um, and you know, what is the kind of the epilogue of your parents? And then the other question from another participant um, talks about the idea of how does this experience inform you and how you navigate parenting? So kind of continuing the dots of you know this weaving together, stitching these fragments together, right? Um, uh, of your parents and then of you becoming a parent. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, incorporating those. I saw, I saw those questions. Um, so thank you for um, uh, putting them all into conversation. Um, well, first, you know, uh, my parents are, are doing well. They're here in the U.S., Things are moving slowly at a glacial pace, but that's what we kind of wanted because we didn't really want to take to to put move things forward in their litigation for asylum in the past administration. Um, so we were waiting for you know um, for good news, um, which you know came. Um, uh, we are going to have a new administration on January twentieth. So um, we're looking forward to, to um, speeding that up now, but they're fine, they're here. My mother lives with me. Um, like I said, she's translating my book. She is spending time with my son that she would have never had, um, you know, even with her own other grandchildren from, you know, my brother and my sister, she never got to really know them as kids because she was working all the time because we were all so busy and so, you know, living here with me, especially through a pandemic where a lot of our time is spent here at home has been invaluable for her. And for me, you know, um, she's teaching me how to be a better parent. I'm not the best parent. I'm not, I don't think I'm even a good parent. Um, I'm working, I'm working to undo generations of masculinity, of toxic masculinity that were handed uh, you know, down and uh, inculcated, whether by force or by example. Um, so I am really trying to to undo, you know, many many years of or unlearn how I was raised by my father. Um, there were things that he taught me that were, you know, useful, but much of his raising of us was, you know, very old fashioned. So my mother is teaching me how to be tender, how to be kind, how to be patient with my son. And I know that my son is gonna have questions of where he is from, who he is, what does, you know, he was born here, he's a citizen. Um, what does it mean that he's a citizen and I'm not? Um, I know he's going to have these questions, and I want to be ready for for that. Um, you know, again, going back to that uh, that idea, we don't. There's things that we don't necessarily talk about, and I I want to break that chain of silence that we don't necessarily talk about. You know, certain things. Um, so yeah, I'm. Parenting has changed my life. It has, you know, I've um, I've become a different kind of writer um, because of being a parent. I think the poet Lucille Clifton, when asked, uh, "Why are your Why are your poems so short?" she said, "Well, I have four kids. You know, um, I can finish them uh, easier if they're shorter." 
um, for me, likewise, I think my book, my first book, Sansontle, um, was very abstract, very conceptual, very kind of strange. And my new poems going forward, my new work going forward after being a parent has been a lot more straightforward, to the point, less figurative, more blunt. I think parenting has done that to me is be more realistic and be more to the point. Cause I can't, you can't be abstract with the two-year-old. You know, you, you gotta be like, you can't have this cookie right now. This is why not. You can't be like, does the cookie exist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I, yeah, I totally hear you as a parent and I am just, I'm really, just really excited about what you're talking about in terms of, and I'm coming back to this idea of being seen and, and unseen and the idea of, you know, of, of naming things that have been in silence as a way of, you know, uh, moving across those those two areas of, of being seen and being unseen um, as well and um, you know addressing our experiences of masculinity and and uh, and in a very open way addressing how you know machismo has affected you know the shaping of our identities our families and things like that so powerful um, there's one more question that we want to um, uh, share with you from the audience this evening and um, James Stewart writes that um, early in the book, you speak of the physical reality of the border and how you feel lost in the space in between. Um, in other places, you speak on your bisexuality and without diminishing your experience of that or your family, do you draw any personal comparisons between the unclaimed status of an undocumented person and the challenges of being bisexual in a world that resists claiming that identity. So kind of looking at, at borderlands of, you know, both nationality and sexuality. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think the whole, my whole first book dealt with the liminality of, of, um, of identity, of, trying to figure out those things about me. And I think I had the privilege of, of coming out twice, once both in terms of sexuality and another in terms of um, status. Um, and I say it as a privilege because they are, you know, there. I, I saw similarities in both of them and I saw similarities of existing in this kind of limbo um, in terms of documentation status. Um, I saw that being manifested in the, you know, the um, boundlessness of, of the border in the almost um, supernatural aspect of its presence. Um, and I say in the book, you know, you, the border isn't just necessarily on the, in, the, in the Southwest and it isn't just that physical wall. It's something that you carry with you um, beyond. And it's something, it's something that, uh, you know, feels like a kind of surveillance an all existing kind of um, presence. And so for me, those comparisons were very, were eerily similar in terms of what I was, what I was trying to define, you know, being in a marriage um, and trying to um, figure out what it meant to identify as bi. And at the same time, you know, and being married and whether that invalidated me. So I think the whole first book, and I'm glad um, Mayor Woodard's asked me to read that first poem because the whole first book hinges on that first line um, of, um, you know, because the bird flew before there was a word for flight, years from now there will be a name for what you and I are doing. Just because there isn't a name for it doesn't mean that it's not real yet, you know, so maybe there will be more books to be written later. Yeah, yeah, that, that idea of, of pioneering um, that 
that um, those you know new ways of being, new ways of being, and also dealing with how previously existing borders and and delineations have um, have challenged us to you know to to embody you know whatever what we are called to you know to uh, to to live as and um, and so um, yeah I mean I am so excited about um, what you have shared this evening and um, you know in particular too I'm thinking about what you said about the the border not just being a physical line and I'm thinking about you know the references. Um, to your family history over a hundred years, and and you know, for my family story, it's it's the same. And my you know, my grandfather who crossed in 1917 as a kid still, you know, felt nervous about carrying his ID in a certain way everywhere he went, no matter you know what he did and how he served this country. Um, and so, um, I am. I am really deeply um, grateful to you, uh, Marcelo, for sharing with us this evening. And I'm especially grateful for the conversations that your work is spurring here in Tacoma and beyond, and that your words perhaps can start to name those things and provide vocabulary to successive generations of youth, and in particular, undocumented youth. Um, and that to me is tremendously exciting. So I wanna thank you and Mayor Woodards um, for leading us in a conversation this evening. Um, and of course, thank you to all the participants and those who asked questions and to the Tacoma Public Library and the Tacoma Reads series, which has many events yet to come. So thanks everyone. Gracias a todos y que tengan muy buenas noches. Thank, thank you, you so much, Tony. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to um, be our host this evening and to ask the questions. We are so grateful for you and for sharing even just a little bit of your own story um, this evening. And Marcelo, I just can't say it enough. We are so grateful um, that, that, you, um, that you chose to be here with us this evening, just to go in just a little bit deeper um, so that people could really get a greater understanding um, uh, of your perspective and why you wrote this book and how you wrote this book and how important it was for you to tell your story. Um, I also wanna thank all of our community partners um, who joined us, who were part of this and to everybody who joined us tonight, I, whether you were here in the webinar or on Facebook Live or for those who will watch it in the future, um, what an amazing conversation and not just a conversation for conversation's sake, sake but what an opportunity for us to learn. Um, from you, um, what, what it not only means to have had this experience, but for those of us who haven't had the same exact experience, what we can do um, as members of this community. And I, I wanna be, I wanna also be sure to share that with people who are listening tonight that the city of Tacoma is working very closely with our community partners um, on the issue of our detention center and other immigration issues in our community. So I just wanna remind everybody that um, there on our City of Tacoma website, um, you can find um, FAQs about the work that we're doing around the, around the ICE Processing Center. I also want to remind everybody that this is not just a City of Tacoma issue. As a matter of fact, most of the laws and most of the things that need to be fixed can't be done here in Tacoma, but really are on the federal level, as you even mentioned. So we want to make sure that, that people continue to contact um, their members of Congress. Um, to let them know what they can continue to do. Um, and you can also find on our website, a resolution that's been passed by the city council um, calling for the immigration and customs enforcement to be replaced by a non-racist organization um, that can humanely enforce immigration laws and for the release of the, of the detainees at the Northwest Ice Processing Center. Um, so just, just grateful um, to you all. Um, please, if you have not read the whole book, if you have not purchased the book, please be sure to go get your copy of Children of the Land. Again, Marcelo, thank you for being here. See, Antonio, Tony and I have it. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good night. Be safe. Um, COVID is still here. Um, but thank you for being here. Be safe with yourselves and your family. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.